Okay, we're good. Okay, awesome. Do you want to stay here or are you... Um, yeah, just feel free to like go anywhere. Alright, I think we're ready. You up? Do you want to put it up here? I'm going to too much. I'll have to do the... Do you want to... No, I'm fine. Okay, I'll just see if you want to. I prefer it this way. Okay, geeks. That's it all. We're making it here too long. This is a, this is a, a short little brief talk. Um, I'm hoping that it's, um, the microphone's going to not cause too much feedback or anything else that usually happens in this lecture theatre. And I've always wanted to do this. Okay, choose it's a joke. Thank you. A lot of this festival over the next few days of both um, family, public time and professional time is all about the future. Here at the University of Melbourne, some of us are also interested in the past in terms of science and uh, myself and my good buddy Morgan here are both part of something called the History and Philosophy of Science, which is a little branch of history that looks at science and technology specifically and its impact on, well, everything else basically. And we go back centuries and millennia in trying to understand how human beings have felt, thought, acted when it came to science and technology. Um, my particular PhD that I'm doing, I've been doing it for quite some time, it almost feels like I've been doing it since the period I'm studying, although that's not quite true, has to do with the early days of rocketry in Australia. Those first few years of the space age when anything seemed possible, when lots of ambitions suddenly became fulfillable because we acquired the ability to launch instruments, technology, people into the upper atmosphere, firstly, and then into water, and then beyond. Now, my particular focus is on the science. There were a number of reasons why things were being sent away from the surface of the Earth, um, and a particularly important one, because basically it initiated the space age, uh, was science. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about... Don't make it. I'm going to talk a little bit about a particular aspect of the story. Now, it's a pretty well-known story, which is what I'm not going to talk about. The well-known story is that there's a thing, there's a movie called The Dish, which I guarantee everybody in this room will have heard of if they haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, you can always drive to Parks and buy one of the hundreds of copies that are available at Parks Radio Telescope at a lower price of whatever it is these days because they've got hundreds of them there and people aren't buying them. There's a feel good story to do, there's a feel good story to do with the dish that Australians look back on fondly, and I look back on it fondly, and I'm, I'm not here to unfondalise it. Um, I'm here to say that. Um, there are bits of the story that are less known. And I became interested in this some time ago because I wondered why it was that given all the technology that existed in Australia in the 1950s compared to the 60s, why it was that a place like Australia didn't have an active space program. What do we mean by space program? Well, we don't mean astronauts, obviously. We mean a program of rockets being launched for scientific purposes, unmanned, in most cases, not reaching orbit, but going up into the upper atmosphere and seeing what's there by a variety of sensory means. We didn't have a native technological base to really make that happen at the time, but there was a feeling that this was something we could tap. And so I'm going to talk about it, and I'll start that up now. So, settle in. If anyone's watching Peppa Pig for the Little East, just get, get a little one for you. And uh, we'll begin. Now, before I go off the title page, this is, uh, this is a particular rocket that was launched. Now, it's called a Long Tom, which uh, is a famous suggestion to me. Um, don't know why they named these things these, what they did back in the day. Uh, it was 
And it's important to the story, this was not a rocket you bought off the shelf. This was a rocket cobbled together, basically using spare parts, um, mostly by Australians. And the idea was that this rocket could be used basically for ballistics testing. What do I mean by that? I mean, this is a rocket that accelerates very, very quickly. And if you can track the rocket, and you can observe the properties of the atmosphere and of the rocket, as it flies. There's a fairly sinister undertone to that because the rocket is designed to accelerate at high speed because it's designed to be a missile, not a rocket, for the payload. But it was the Cold War. So I'm just going to talk about a few things, and it is going to be brief. A little bit of background, then a brief little few things to say about the event that really precipitated the start of the Space Age, which is the International Geophysical Year in 1957. That meant a few things for Australia, and it's relevant to the story. Then we'll mention two proposals, well actually I only mention one of them because the second one is basically a cheaper rerun of the first one, about putting things into the high atmosphere and if the scientists really had their heart's desires fulfilled to put things in orbit. Now part of the story, the happy ending part of the story is that we eventually did put a satellite in orbit, 1967, but that's not part of the story today. I'll mention it. And then finally, uh, why it was, and this is my little annoying little thing that I'm doing in the thesis, and really you can sum it up in two lines, but I've got to turn it into 80,000 words, is why it is that all the good stuff that Australia was doing, which was supporting Americans, supporting Europeans, even supporting the Russians in a sort of informal way in terms of tracking satellites and putting things up and building things, etc. Um, why that got in the way of the federal government, which was the Menzies government for the most part, uh, well, for all the period we're talking about, the Menzies government, uh, why it was that that was a problem if you wanted to have a domestic space program. So go back to 1920, there's a person that most of you have heard of called Robert Goddard. He put out a book, bookish, booklet, paper in 1919, a method of reaching extreme altitudes. People who understood Newtonian mechanics thought it was a good idea, the New York Times thought it was idiotic. I put this in apropos of nothing to mention that there are a wide variety of people in the world who seem to think they know how to do science better than the scientists. Now that, um, that plays out in climate change pretty predominantly these days. Um, but back in the day, there were a lot of people who thought a rocket just couldn't work in space because it had nothing to push against. And he thought, okay, uneducated fringe people. Um, well, uneducated fringe people apparently read the New York Times because um, they famously told otherwise. Um, Happily, the New York Times did uh, come to the rescue of itself, though, and they swiftly rebutted what was said in the editorial in 1920. And just before Apollo 11 was launched, they um, acknowledged the error that recently had been made. <laughs> and uh, they did regret the error, and uh, luckily they did check out Isaac Newton and discovered he thought this out quite some time before. Now, why, why is this appropriate to mention in this talk? Well, because the main man in this talk he is a man. More on that in a minute. This man, David Forbes Martin, was a foundation fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. He played a fairly strong role in, in building the Academy of Science and getting it chartered in 1954. He came to Australia as a recruit to the CSI. Um, that venerable institution that governments still support unequivocally. In 1927, he was recruited to work on the one area of the CSIRR's brief that was not specifically about agriculture, and that is radio. Still about agriculture when you think about it, actually. This is a, a highly important technology in the 1920s, and still is, um, in, in various developed ways. And he came out here as a, he was about 21, I think, and he 
he'd um, done most of his study already in the UK, he was from Scotland, um, and he made a home in Australia and became quite a defender of Australia's interests later on. I don't suppose those kids up the back could be a little more quiet, could they? Any chance? Okay, I'm sorry. Now, Dr. Martin, why why he's slightly relevant to Robert Goddard is that he was quite the popularizer. I'll throw a couple of examples out as we work through. He didn't just spend his time in the lab. He spent his time giving lectures to the public. He spent his time on ABC radio quite frequently through the 1950s. He started this after a conference, I think, in 1950, and he came back to Australia and realised this was something that was really important. And he quite liked, it seems, giving lectures and talks to the public on how cool space travel was and how cool it would be if Australia got involved with it. This was before satellites were being launched. This is years before that. Now, one of the reasons he became very interested in rocketry was because of what Robert Goddard and some others before him had already realised, which was that you could put instruments on a rocket, send it into the upper atmosphere. You didn't need to have the thrust or specific impulse to make it to orbit. It only needed to linger in the upper atmosphere for a few minutes with its instruments. You could parachute the instruments back to Earth, possibly, or whatever, have a good rocket that would absorb the impact, and you'd be able to study those regions of the atmosphere in a way that you couldn't do from the ground. That was the plan, in a nutshell. Now, he was a strong advocate for this. He was also a very eminent person by the 1950s. He also worked on radar during the war, as many physicists did. So I'm slightly segueing here, so I want to make another point. Uh, Radar obviously has to do with atmospherics as well. Um, this is just a picture of the secret radar. I don't know, it doesn't seem very secret to me out on the coast of Dover Heights, but it's uh, nonetheless, it was secret. Um, I've been out there, it's, it's a beautiful spot if you're ever in Sydney, by the way, just uh, south of South Head. There's a lighthouse nearby. A uh, very pretty place, and they were able to do tests for, the reason it's on the coast is so they could see if incoming aircraft could be detected, and they could up to 100 kilometres or more out to sea. And this was technology that was developed uh, at the time. Um, Martin had gone to the UK at the behest of the government in 1940, a sort of emergency trip to tap into the radar research that was going on there. He brought his knowledge back. Um, they passed this on to a group that formed and went to work on developing a, a coastal system of radar, uh, particularly in the Northern Territory, where the Japanese aircraft were expected to come, and did. Now I mentioned this in slight segue because, um, and this, this, is a bit of a, this is a bit of a shout out to any of the girls in the room who might have misgivings that doing physics is a bit of a boys club, which it may have once been, and to tell you, do not, do not by any stretch of the imagination be put off by the idea that just because you're a girl, you can't do this stuff. And this project to do with radar was the first time that women were employed in Australia as physicists. And there were three of them, and the one I draw your attention to is um, this very remarkable lady, Ruby Payne Scott. There's Boris, who I'm interested in going out and having a read of it. And she was. An excellent physicist laid down some of the principles of radio astronomy that have become part of the parlance. She was a, a brilliant teacher by all accounts, a brilliant mind, and she had a very short career because the uh, CSIRO eventually found out she was married. And uh, like, like many women who managed to get into a professional rank in those days, she did that for about five years and then it was discovered. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to get into, uh, into this discussion in detail, but I do draw it to your attention because I, this, is, this festival is also about the future and I'd like to think that this sort of bullshit doesn't matter anymore. She was a very interesting lady. And she had to quit. Anyway, 
Dr. Martin, Dr. Martin didn't have to quit. He got on with things. And as I said, we spent a lot of time trying to get the public interested in this topic. It's unclear, we don't have polling, we don't have a lot beyond anecdote about what the public thought about this sort of thing, but there's a general sense that you might draw from it that there were plenty of interested persons in Australia about this sort of activity. Um, it was a longer talk, I bring you some examples of the media as it was acting towards supporting this um, endeavour. There are a number of journalists in various newspapers around Australia, particularly in South Australia, who supported this uh, endeavour of the scientists. If you look there, you'll see that's just an example of one of his uh, programs that's on. This is what people used to read before the age of television, or what was going to be on the radio. This is ABC Radio in Adelaide in August 1951. Um, I was trying to find out if this was live or not, and it probably was. It's um, been around Australia. Now, Dr. Martin was able to do more than just talk on the radio. Being an academician, he was also able to form a committee, and that's what he did. And the first committee that the Academy of Science formed was the Upper Atmosphere Research Committee. Again, for Sputnik, Sputnik, before satellites, and they were hoping to do something. Their opportunity came with this event, and a lot of people have heard of it. The International Geophysical Year was a, a collaborative exercise using as many collaborations as possible across the world in earth science and long story short it was the reason that the US government decided to get behind the launching of a satellite. There are a few competing plans to do that. They eventually settled on uh, one which was going to be part of this endeavour. They also of course wanted to be first with it. Didn't quite make that because the Russians also had plans to launch a satellite. Um, they were a bit more vague about it, as the Soviets tended to be. There was, there was definitely the, um, the awareness that the satellite was going to be launched by them, but there was also a kind of uh, presumption that the Americans would do it first. Didn't quite work out that way. What did that mean for Australia? Well, it meant a couple of things. One was that, and as I say, that most of our involvement was in Antarctica doing Antarctic things, and we still do that. But uh, the committee, headed by Martin, was really interested in the idea of being able to launch a rocket for the first time in Australia into the upper atmosphere and do some science. Now, well, um, in my thesis, the, I go through all the, the pain of doing that. Uh, it wasn't an easy process and it took a while to work out and convince all the right people that this is something that should be part of the program. Um, but long story short, there was a rocket launch. And it was launched, surprise, surprise, from this place. Now, virtually everybody in the room, I would think, has been, have heard of Woomera. It's, that's a picture taken at the time. I believe that's the Europa uh, launcher from probably the later 60s. One of the reasons why the science in Australia thought they had a chance of convincing the government to spend money on rockets for them was because the government had already done the hard part, which was build the spaceport. A lot of countries didn't have a spaceport, but they had scientists who wanted to launch rockets, and that was a little more problematical. Now, the history of this place has been covered. Um, Peter Morton's written the book on the history of the, the rocket range at Woomera. You'll see the range on the Australia map there. It goes from um, Woomera in South Australia up to northwest Western Australia. That was the, the test lane for ballistic missile testing. The place wasn't built as a spaceport. It was there to test missiles that would become part of Britain's nuclear arsenal. Australia was a partner in it after some negotiation. Uh, there was some talk of Australia also getting missiles like this, but uh, it wasn't a particularly um, high, high uh, item on the agenda. Uh, but the British government had to choose between the icy wastes of Canada and the sunny climes of Australia, and the clear skies of Australia went out. Now again, what happened? We launched the rocket. Didn't work out, actually. These things happen. That's no big deal. 
the idea was that we were going to launch a rocket, um, release something called window, which is basically metal strips into the atmosphere. They'd be tracked by radar, and we would see what the wind patterns were like up there, many tens of kilometres uh, above the surface of the Earth. Uh, unfortunately, it deployed prematurely at about 30,000 feet, and that wasn't um, really valuable. Uh, but the point was, it was done, there was collaboration, and maybe it set a bit of a uh, framework for the future. And everybody was very happy about it, including the government, and it didn't take much effort to at least convince the government to see proposals on a further program. And, and after some doing, the program was work whittled down to about eight experiments, costings were worked out, and then it got slightly interesting. They couldn't use they couldn't use that long time rocket anymore for the reasons I said before, because it just accelerated too quickly and would um, probably damage the instruments apart from not being in the atmosphere for long enough to do anything meaningful. But it basically leads here to a turf war. There were several groups that were interested in running something like this because it was a damn cool thing. And those parties were three. The Department of Supply, which ran Warmerer, well, the Weapons Research Establishment, which was part of the Department of Supply, which ran Warmerer, the military. There was the CSIRO, who was actually Martin's employer, but he seems to have had a complicated relationship with them and wanted to have his own power base uh, apart from them so he could run things. And this was the Academy of Science. And Again, this is something I go, to in, go into in my thesis, but um, his correspondence around the time seems to be increasingly tailored to being the agency, the space agency, and he has correspondence with um, NASA and various other American entities where he seems to style himself in that way. And it led to a slight bit of um, kerfuffle because the CSRO were insisting that they were the ones that should be running this. Anyway. If you're going to convince the government to give you lots of money, you have to give them some good reasons. And there's a whole literature about the so-called big science era that's come up since the Second World War, where things are just too expensive for private entities really to be able to manage a lot of the spending. Before World War II, that was somewhat different. Once you started getting into high tech, you need to have a financier of some sort. Now, there's plenty of private money around as well, um, but that wasn't really a, um, an avenue in this case. This was meant to be a national program. So some of the reasons that come to mind as, and were in the, in the documents were a lot of it was to do with reputation. It's sometimes hard to justify basic science to somebody who wants to see applied science and is willing to pay money for applied science. Uh, and, and the only other avenue often is something like reputational prestige. And this looms large in the justifying documentation from the Academy. There was also this feeling that, well, we do want you to spend some money, but we recognise Australia is not a large country. There are only about eight or nine million people around. The economy wasn't huge. We didn't have a large manufacturing base. What do we do? Well, this one's a good one. We've got to pick and choose between scientific projects. This is a good one. And the reason it's a good one is because A, we already have expertise in it, and B, because the whole world needs to study the upper atmosphere because we just don't even know what's up there. And what we do know suggests it's different everywhere. It's something every country can play a role in. So it's about prestige. And at the UN, there was a committee that started up called there's the acronym Populos, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And at the time, it was a prestigious committee to be on. Only a few countries were on it. And Australia argued its way on there because we were supporting the Americans and the Europeans. Every other country on there was launching its own rockets. And there were quite a few questions about why it was Australia was claiming the spot. Um, but they managed to win the day. There was a Cold War element to it. We needed to know what the constituents of the upper atmosphere were because we expected nuclear missiles to go flying through it. 
at some early stage in the future. And apparently, because it's there, which is a bit of a worry when you're trying to use politicians. So as I said, there was a dispute, can't resolve between the ministers, got rather heated, and then ultimately got rejected. Too much money, and the other reason was because we seem to be making rockets anyway at Woomera, we're making them out of spare parts. Um, maybe the government didn't really need to fund this stuff, maybe it was something we could, we could pull out of other revenue streams. So the prestige was lost, and also the control was lost from the point of view of science. And the prestige was already taken care of. And the reason it was already taken care of is because we were doing things for other people. And this was seen to be enough on the part of the government. The other thing is that we were doing things for other people, but they were paying us for the privilege. And in terms of revenue, and I hate to say it all comes down to revenue, but maybe in a large sense it did. Um, that is what uh, ultimately swayed the argument on this. So just a couple of quick picks, and that one, that's at Island Lagoon, that was the first tracking station that was set up at Woomera to track the early satellites, um, dismantled now, uh, but already sort of famous and well-known and indicative. Um, of what Australia was doing. We also supported European efforts to use Woomera, which they paid a lot of money to do. And that um, logo up the top right is called ESRO, which is European Space Research Organization, of which Australia became a member because we had the launch facilities back in the day. It's the forerunner of the European Space Agency. And of course, NASA. And there's, there's one of their early logos instead of the one that you know, used, might be used to seeing, which came along later. So, in a nutshell, all the dish type stuff counted against, in my, this is my argument in the thesis, the dish type stuff counted politically against the scientists because their argument of prestige for Australia didn't wash because we were already doing really cool, prestigious things. It didn't make sense, it seems, to spend money on prestige, on domestic rocket science, when you had other people paying Australia to come here and do prestigious things on our behalf. The scientists wondered maybe if we just made it cheaper, it would work out the next time, but yeah, long story short, it didn't. It also, it also had the negative effect of making it look as if what they were doing wasn't that important. And sometimes in politics, if you stick to your guns, it's more convincing an argument to say this is an important thing rather than wash and water it down and give the impression that there's stuff you can do without. And this seems to have been, reading the cabinet papers, this seems to be the way this was responded to. Um, and we're talking here about 1962 or so. And there, it petered out. There's no end to this day. Happily, what happened regardless was that the University of Adelaide, which has already kind of been involved in uh, work at Woomera, um, for geographically uh, obvious reasons, I guess, uh, there was a kind of informed collaboration. The military weren't that happy about the idea of the scientists going there anyway, but um, that wasn't universal. And when Professor John Carver arrived at the University of Adelaide in the mid-60s, we got there in 61, but then realised that this was a program that the university could distinctively undertake. They were able to work out a way, taking spare parts, putting rockets together, um, doing it without official funding. They actually thought, this sort of slightly amusing stuff for the documents, but they thought that Canberra didn't realise what they were doing. 
but um, uh, Cameron didn't realize what they were doing, but they kind of did, and everybody kind of went along with this. Um, so we ended up getting quite a few launches happening from about um, 65 onwards into the 70s. Um, so there was a space program, eventually, of sorts. Not an official national one, but everyone knew it was happening. People were reasonably pleased with it, and we did get some good science done. I'm not going to judge whether it was enough, whether it was the right sort, um, but that's something I talk about in my thesis. And finally, of course, we did get a satellite launch. So everyone can feel quite warm and fuzzy about that. But another one not done through funding, but because somebody had a spare problem. Thank you for your attention.